Okay. So namaskar everyone. Welcome you all to this uh, 16th sessions of Srimad Bhagavad Gita with Sundar Rajan ji. And uh, no one needs any introduction. So just over to Sundar Rajan ji to take the things. Yes. Thank you, please. Thank you, ji. And uh, before we start, as always, welcome uh, to the 16th um, session. And before we start this session, we'll go over with the invocation from the Vedic mantras and then we'll start. So please join me when we say Om Sahana Vavatu Sahana Bhunaktu Sahavir Yam Karava Vahai Tejasvina Vadhita Mastuma Ved Vishavahai Om Shanthashanthashanthi Hari Om Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha Hari Om So welcome everybody to our um, sessions on the Bhagavad Gita and uh, last week or till last week we were learning uh, things from chapter 16 uh, first chapter 16 and then to chapter 14 which was the three gunas right and we came to a section where bhagavan talks about the three gunas and starts enumerating the the qualities of the gunas and how it manifests in us so this time what we thought is we'll make it more of a quiz type style rather than a sermon and talk about what the gunas are and do a self assessment as we go so i encourage all of you to have a pen and paper and ha- paper handy so that the style will be more of a question followed by you know these are the traits and you'll give yourselves marks and we'll go over the rules in a bit <clears throat> so before we do for the audience who have missed in the past there are three gunas or three principal qualities of the universe and it's called prakriti prakriti is mother nature and in mother nature there are three different qualities that are prevalent one is sattvic which is serenity uplifting and uh, more towards spiritual maturity rajas which is about activity and uh, you know uh, things that make it happen action oriented and the last one is tamas the traditional uh colors given to these uh, but the colors are only demarcations are the white red and black i just gave it for visual effect as to yellow red and uh, blue the colors don't mean much but in our sense the qualities mean a lot so sattva leads you to maturity and spiritually focused so a sattvic person when you think of yourself as having more sattvic think of yourself as more being more spiritually focused grounded progressive and more likely to succeed in terms of spirituality rajas because of its activity nature tends to be very spiritually distracted and more materialistically focused <clears throat> so it's none of these are bad it's just that we'll do a self assessment as to what is most manifested in us and all of us have all a combination of all these three gunas and rajas also becomes very fickle and digressive it's like a baby right with short attention span going around exploring things making things happen it's not about the principles but it is about what can be seen and achieved it always tries to go and grab and to, in order to have spiritual maturity rajas needs focus training and discipline abhyasa and vairagya to move over to sattvic and from there it moves over to moksha <clears throat> the last one is tamas or passivity spiritual dormancy like it's like a sleeping baby so dormancy basically is linked to inertness a little bit of confusion and a lack of inclination to be spiritually progressive so this needs a bit of kick starting so anybody who's tamasic that's essentially everybody has the potential to be spiritually liberated that is the name of the game and in order to attain moksha the kick starting is needed to move them into rajas and then spiritual focus and discipline is needed to move them into sattva and then the maturity sets in and then liberation sets in so that's the progression of the gunas having said that let us begin our game so before we do there are certain rules <clears throat> so have a pen and paper ready for those who joined uh, just now or late so for each question there will be multiple questions and i have a few questions here hopefully to cover just this one hour 
and then there'll be a part two next week because we are covering chapters 14, 17, and 18 that has all the Triguna related qualities. And each of the questions will have three answers and no surprises here. One indicates Sattva, the other Rajas, and the third one is Tamas. And for each of these choices, it's not a, a zero sum game. So it's not your 100% Sattvic or 100% Rajasic or 100% Tamasic. So for example, I'll ask you a question and we'll see the example later. <clears throat> Rate yourself on a scale of zero to 10, whether you're least likely to have that quality, you know, none of the time or more, almost every time. So it's, it's a range, right? So for example, if somebody asks you, do you feel lazy? Okay, but 20% so on a scale of one to zero to 10, maybe, you know, eight out of 10 times. Or do I feel spiritually inclined? Yeah, zero out of 10 times. Like I'm an atheist, I don't believe in it, so zero. That's why it's not a one to 10, it's a zero to 10, right? Sometimes you have none of this quality at all. And be as honest and, and pragmatic as possible. Like, because these answers are not for me, they're for yourself. And it'll help you understand where you stand in the spiritual spectrum and grow from there. And know that there are no wrong answers because all these answers, no matter what, is not to make you feel bad about yourself. It is just an assessment. I tell my kids, when they get a certain mark, say, let's say you get 95 in math. It's not a great thing or a bad thing. It's just that you have a 5% gap. And see what that 5% gap is and fill it off. Right? That's, that's all it is. Or you get you know 25% in math, then you have a 75% gap. And then you have to see how you can fill that 75%. So all these assessments tell us where we stand and what we need to do to get ourselves to completion. So that's what it is. And absolutely no pressure for you to reveal your scores to anyone here. It's for you, if you want to reveal, that's great. But otherwise it's just for you to understand and uh, <clears throat> you know, take that and go from where you are to where you wanna be. Okay. Having said that, the, the way you set up your paper is you have the questions and have three columns, sattva, one for rajas and one for thamas. So this is more of an example. So if I talk about the general traits, traits on a scale of zero to 10, my general trait would be like four out of 10, so 40% sattva. Maybe I'm 80%, eight out of 10 times I'm a rajasic. Two out of 10 times I'm tamasic, like morning and evening, I'm too lazy or Sunday mornings, those kind of things. My eating habit is not sattvic at all. I mean, I'm not giving it for myself, but this is the example. 100% or 90% is rajasic. You know, some people have alcohol and those kind of things. So they're thamsic, so three. And you, you get the idea. So I don't have to go over each of these, but you get the idea as to, for every question, put yourself the Z, scale of zero to 10 in every single column, right? Because each, then you can count it and say, okay, this is, the amount of sattvic sobhava I have or a rajasik or a tamasik. So hope everybody is ready and we'll start our first question now. The first one is a predominant trait. So in this question, the, <clears throat> the nature of, of sattva, rajas and tamas is revealed. Question number one, which of these qualities represents you? So it's self-perception and it's also other people telling you, right? So if I were to ask three of your friends to describe yourself and what would they say? And, and again, there's a mixed match of this. So on a scale of zero to 10, for a sattva, in general, you're relaxed, calm, composed, very insightful, and you understand a problem very intelligently. And when people say you emanated brilliance, on a scale of zero to 10, you can mark yourself. Or do people say that you're very active and energetic and restless and over ambitious, sometimes greedy, and you're enterprising and you have an insatiable craving to achieve success and bigger. Is that does that represent you on a scale of you know zero to ten? Or do people do you think or do people think that you're lazy or lack initiative or your procrastination, you're procrastinating, lacking attention to detail, or you're careless, right? Or do people think, or even you think, you're delusional and feeling a bit down and low? 
Now, when I say down and low, it doesn't mean, you know, when you just wake up. I mean, in general, if you're feeling general, when people are happy around you, you're feeling down and low and not feeling like, you know, engaging. If that happens more often than it's a higher number, happens occasionally, it's a one out of 10 or something like that. <clears throat> or sometimes it's just a zero, right? So mark that, that's the first question that we want to see. The second one is the goals and results. So what is your attitude? What drives you? What, what motivates you to do things? And what are the results you get out of that work you do normally, right? So when, when you take up a work you know, professionally in your profession, or when it's uh, mostly it should be something that's not connected with a salary, right? So if you're self-employed, then profession. If you're uh, uh, employed in a profession, then outside, like your hobbies and other things. Your actions, do they lead you to a deeper understanding of the subject? Meaning, are you driven by inquisition to understand and cultivate a knowledge? You take up an activity for, for gaining knowledge. Is that what your uh, uh, passion or ambition is? Or are you driven by, a, sorry, that is number one, sattva right? Column one. Column two is, are you driven by ambition and a thirst for power? Either you get something materially back or you want to achieve higher power. You want to be in the executive board or something. So is that what you're you know, working towards? Or you strive for material goal and sometimes you get greedy in the way. And does this dream not allow you to sleep at all? Like we see all those motivational quotes, right? Don't uh, sleep till you achieve your goal and, you know, dreams is that what you keeps you awake? Is that you? Meaning, you know, when you wake up, is it the first thing that drives you? So put that on a scale of one to 10. The higher it is, then you're more rajasic in nature. And lastly, but not the least on this category is the thamasic attitude, which is <clears throat> usually you're not very sure about the nature of the work itself. You feel lost. You feel disengaged, but you don't know why you're doing, but you're doing it. So it is something you've taken up, but you don't know why you're doing it. So you're not believing in the cause. And sometimes it happens. And we're not talking about this as a learning stage, but like Sattvika, you, you enter something to learn where you don't know anything and you can kind of, you learn on the, on the fly. But there are other things where you were given a task or you take up a task, you feel like it's forced upon you and you have no motivation. And your entire uh, reason for doing it is, you know, it's just confusing. You don't know why you're doing it at all, right? And there's no end to it. And then there's sometimes we feel that way in, in certain situations. So is that you? Are you not driven to achieve and you have no aim on what to do in life or what to do with that task? So again, this is on a scale of one to 10 or to zero to 10. And just think of situations and put a mark. And I'm guaranteeing you, if you see this video, you know, say five months from now, this course will change because this is based on your present attitude, right? So that's how you kind of see if, if you're progressing for the good or reversing for the bad, right? So spiritual progress, think of this as a spiritual progress litmus test. <clears throat> so far, I hope everybody is with me. Okay. Now, the third one is the prayers. So basically, Bhagavad Gita talks about what kind of deities do you pray to or your role models? Basically, when I say role model, if I'm praying to Hanumanji, Hanumanji is not just the deity I pray to. I'm looking for certain qualities of Hanumanji or Saraswati Mata. So the person I pray to automatically or subconsciously, subconsciously becomes my role model. And that's what I'm looking at and seeing what motivates me to pray to certain people. So Sattvika, am I praying to the Devatas? Devatas are usually divine beings who are kind and promote upliftment, right? So the var, Vardhan. So do I ask when I do a prayer in the morning, do I ask, oh Lord, Please give me devotion, devotion, strength, and the ability to withstand pressures and ability to withstand stress and strain. Am I asking for making myself a good person? Am I asking for wisdom and peace and love 
and inner strength. Is that what I'm asking for? So Devata, Vandana, and your motivation for that, then that makes you a Satvika. Because all these qualities are working towards making yourself a better person, right? So evolution or evolving is the aim of this attitude. Whereas a Rajasic person prays to Yakshas and Rakshasas. So Guvera is one of the Yakshas, right? So you are you want wealth, then you have Kuvera Yagnya, and you, you have this, uh, what do you call it? Uh, they have the copper plates with the yantras and all those things, and they pray to yoginis and yakshinis and all those. So is that your motivation? So are you looking for material wealth and success, or are you bargaining or trading with the deities, saying, okay, give me a promotion, then I'll come, my, come and shave my head, or as if that's a great thing that God wants. So are you doing something as a trade? I'll do this if you do that kind of thing. If you're bargaining and trading, then you fall into the Rajasik bucket. And the Thamasik is, are you delivering, or sorry, are you devotional to negative and spiteful spirits? <clears throat> it's either called Shudra Vidya. And Bhagavad Gita calls it as uh, worshipping of the corpses. So uh, Preta Bhutan, right? So worshiping, the, worshiping corpses and ghouls and those kind of things. Uh, again, this is open to uh, like the world. I'm not talking about the group here, but if that is the thing, praying to gruesome spirits, not because you care for the scriptures, but because you're seeking a remedy or a parihara for something, or you want to hurt or injure others, the black magic kind of things, the vamachara, right? So if that's the nature, then that's thamasic. I hope and, and I'm pretty sure all of you will give a zero in this category, but that's that's one of the reasons I gave a zero to 10, not a one to 10. Okay. Next is the dietary habits. This is very important. Now, Bhagavad Gita talks in multiple places, chapter four and chapter you know, 14, uh, it talks about, or even 17. Uh, this is chapter 17. So it talks about dietary habit because anad bhavanti bhutani, which means what you eat and what you consume influences your personality, right? A person who eats healthy food automatically becomes healthy. A person who goes towards alcohol and other things automatically, you know, is influenced by the food. Our thinking is directly influenced with what, by what we consume. And more importantly, it is not just the physical food we eat. It is also the food that we consume through our eyes and ears, the information input. <clears throat> and I want to take a couple of minutes here, uh, more than just a slide off slide, is the information we consume in this day and age. You know, back in the days, you had to go to either a movie to watch what's happening. Now things, information is coming to your living room was coming into your living room in the 80s. Now it's coming to your hand. The moment you wake up, that's the first thing you see, right? And we live in an information explosion, age of information explosion, filled with deceit and uh, false information. And it's come to a point where the things giving you information is not even a human being, it's a bot. It's manufactured, right? So what you consume is very important. In, with that in mind, I want to see, or you have to see for yourself, is the food that you're eating, physically, let's start with physical food. Is it ultra healthy and pure and promotes a longer life, like healthy food? And it uh, promotes clear thinking, that is it detoxes your mind. So that kind of detox material. It is fresh and juicy and nourishing, snigdaha, rasyaha, so those kind of things, fresh and juicy. And is it raw and tasteful and unprocessed? Is it low in salt? So all this denotes a very sattviki diet. So sattva guna, and it promotes into like a physical and mental purity and health, right? The more clear your mind is, the better your thinking is, and it's easier for you to be spiritually evolved. <clears throat> Whereas a rajasic person, person who is very active, would naturally be attracted to spicy food. When I say spicy, very spicy food, right? And it's sour, bitter, savory, like salty. 
and deep fried food and pungent food, dehydrating, etc. When I say bitter, it's like high, like caffeinated drinks, coffee, or high energy sugar, the, all those loaded with you know, extra sugar, things that get you pumped and excited. So that's the kind of diet that you know the Rajasik's like, like chips, which is very salty, pop and junk food, you name it. Food that's exciting, but harmful to your body. It increases your oxidation, cell ox oxidation. So that's, it's not good. But it, here it's not, not good part. Here it is the, what category do you fall in part? The not good or good comes later. Okay. So, and the third type is, do you like leftovers, processed food, fridge food, reheatables, right? And unfortunately, as a society, we have become used to this kind of food now. Like the second and third category, which is the junk food and reheatables, has led us into a very rajasic and tamasic diet. And alcohol and downers, or generally anything that's not fresh and promotes dullness of the mind, right? It, it affects you negatively, or it makes you lethargic. So those kind of food. And with information, like the same thing, are you consuming information, news, and when you read something like a book or watch TV shows, are you reading things that makes you intelligent, gains knowledge? Are you listening to you know, Swamiji's speeches kind of things? Are you listening to you know, uh, TV shows where 10 people fight and shout over news? So is, is that what excites you? Or depressing, you know, sad uh, teleserials? So that's the Satvik, Rajasik, and Tamasik of the information side. So this is what you need to grade, uh, rate yourself. Okay, hopefully everybody is rated. And now we move on to the next question. What is your attitude of a yajna? Now yajna is a very big word. In chapter four, there are nine shlokas that uh, talks about yajnas, starting with Brahmarpanam Brahmahavihi, all the way to dietary yajnas, right? Pranayama, then you have the uh, Deva Meva Pari Yajna. So, so, so many Yajnas. Yajna literally, or what we think physically means, there is a Yajna Kunda, the sacrificial altar, and people pour ghee into it and invoke some mantras and devatas come and bless. But Yajna is an effort into which you pour your heart and soul into. Right? So when you work, here you can take it as both spiritual yajna or the yajnas that uh, the Vedas prescribe. Also yajna in your day-to-day -day life. Your entire life itself is a yajna. Do you understand and follow the rules or adhere to the rules? Do you follow it to the letter and spirit of the process? Now I'll give you an example of letter and spirit in a while. <clears throat> but do you actually follow the procedures as it is prescribed? Let us say the Vedic yajnas. Right? Do you work without attachment for the results and perform your duty? And is it a sense of dedication that drives you? So for example, Shraddha Karma or you're doing Vivaha Karma or even your daily Sandhya Vandana. Do you do it because it has to be done or do you do it or you leave it because you're too lazy and tired, you have something else, you deprioritize it, right? So if you're doing your karmas as prescribed, on a daily basis because it has to be done. Then put yourself in the Satriki category. If you put it once in a while, occasionally also it's fine. Like once a year also, it's a number one. Once a month is like number three or four, right? As long as you do it. Otherwise just be very, uh, you know, very honest and put a zero. Put a zero, zero, zero. For a Rajasik, they take commitments and endeavors only if they see a material benefit. So they don't want to do work or even a yajna if there is no return back from it. It's called a ishti. Putrakam ishti or uh, you know those kind of things. They do a yajna to you know or Ganapati Homa and the home then that gets rid of all the you know, evil spirits or whatever it is. Or good things will come or you know prosperity will come. So they, they always is an agenda behind the effort being put. If that is the case then put a, a higher score on the Rajasik one. And for the tamasic, even though it says yajna, it's the same as before. A tamasic doesn't believe in yajna, doesn't you know, work on the cause of yajna. They don't follow the rules. And even if they do it, they do it like they pull, they drag their leg, you know, they, they drag their feet. They don't want to do it. 
And even when they get the benefit of something they've done, they don't want to share it with others. So if that is the attitude, then uh, put a number there. I'm pretty sure here, everybody will put a zero here. And the next one is the three types of tapas. Tapasya. Tapyate means to burn, right? And tapasya is single pointed focus with which you dedicate your entire life towards a single point. One of the best examples of this is Bhagiratha. So all of you know the Ramayana. So Sagara had 60,000 sons or 60 sons who went in search of a sacrificial horse that Indra stole. I'm making the story very short, right? And unfortunately they were cursed, uh, they were uh, burnt up by the curse of Kapila Muni. <clears throat> And uh, the 60,000 uh, sons of Sagara turned into ashes. Sagara had another son called Asaminja. And Asaminja's son, Ansuman, Ansuman's son, Dilipa, Dilipa's son, Bhagiratha, undertook, I mean, all these kids like uh, Amshuban and uh, Dilipa, they strived to bring Ganga to earth and make Sagara. That's why Sagara, Sagara's thing is called Sagara. And they failed because in their lifetime, they could not achieve it. Whereas Bhagiratha, he made it his life's mission, his tapasya, to go after and make whatever was possible to bring Ganga down to earth and make her flow and what is known as the ocean, right? The, 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 the Sagara Ocean. This is an example from the Ramayana. Now, the story apart, Bhagiratha is known for his dedication, his tapasya. It's called Bhagiratha Prayatna. So when you, all of us have something we are working towards in our life. Hopefully it's, it's an aim that takes us to the next level, right? So it's our, our own Bhagiratha Prayatna. Even if it is, for some it is sending their kids to college. That's a Prayatna. That's your Tapasya, right? So in your Tapasya, what is your mode? Like, sorry, uh, I think I'm at, okay. So let's, that's here. So even before I go, I, I think I skipped a slide with the tapasya and all. I shot myself one uh, slide further. So I'm going to go back to this slide where I'm talking about the tapasyas. And there are three types of tapasya that Bhagavad Gita in the chapter 17 talks about. One is physical, one is mental, and one is verbal, right? Mano vakhaya. So the physical tapasya the actual shloka it says you're dedicating your life and you're worshipping Deva, which is Paramatma, Dvija, which is the twice born, intelligent beings who have evolved spiritually, Guru, Guru is your teacher, like when somebody who has given you spiritual knowledge, Pragnya, the people who are wise, and elders. So if you're dedicating your life to understanding and seeking from them, and maintaining physical cleanliness, self-control, and practice of non-violence, ahimsa, that kind of a tapasya is called physical tapasya, right? Verbal tapasya is speaking without causing anxiety or negativity in others. So anudveka vakyam, okay? Udvega means uchalna machalna, anudveka vakyam. So somebody who uh, speaks in a way that is plain, simple, and beneficial to others, and speaking the truth in a way that's very beneficial and uh, pleasing. Satyam, Priyam, Hitam, Chayat, and Swadhyaya or self-study. If that is what you're doing. Now, don't mark yourself on this. This is like a prelude for the next question. So these shlokas are there in chapter 17. And the next question is based on this. Okay. So speaking of Satya, Priya, Hita, there is a shloka from Manusmriti. Very, very uh, deep shloka that I really love. It's the definition of Sanatana Dharma. It says, Satyam Bhruyat, Priyam Bhruyat, Na Bhruyat, Satyam Apriyam. Priyam Cha Na Anrutam Bhruyat, Yesha Dharma Sanatana. This is the eternal dharma. What is the eternal dharma? Satyam Bhruyat, speak the truth. Priyam Bhruyat, speak pleasantly without hurting others and in a very pleasant way. Na bruyat satyam apriyam. Don't speak the truth in a way that hurts others. 
even though it is a truth you don't have to go and tell a person you know um, something like that that was going to hurt them right and the next one is priyamcha na anrutam bruyat even though you are speaking the uh, pleasantly don't say false things don't say lies just to make it pleasant this is sanatana dharma or this is dharma sanatana this is the eternal dharma right it's a beautiful quote so here verbal purity requires that kind of a uh, satya tapas the last one is mental purity this is grade like slowly evolving in grades which is having a very calm and composed mindset manam prasadah composed mind pleasant demeanor and gentleness right sthairyam sthairyam is basically self control or stability of mind always being stable even when the world around you is collapsing right so very controlled and calm mind maunam maunam is the word muni comes from mauna maunam means complete mental silence and not having the chattering you know people are so agitated and disturbed when they meditate they sit for meditation but the mind wanders when you have achieved that mental silence then you have achieved tapasya of the mind right atma vinigraha self control and purity of intent and purity of thoughts this is the mind or mental tapasya now the question comes now what is your, if you are doing any of this then what is your motivation for doing any of the tapasya right assuming that people are doing the tapasya and they want to do it there are three types satvikas they follow this kind of tapasya because they don't have any selfish motive they do it because the scriptures asks them to they are told that's why shastras right shastras are telling you to do this three kind of tapasyas for you to have mental maturity and evolve and because it is your nitya karma or niyata karma the satvikas automatically do it they follow the rules no questions asked if that is your motivation then you put yourself in the satvika category rajasa they do the same kind of tapasya in order to gain fame and popularity they take a yoga course to become a you know yoga celebrity certified yoga very happy they want to start a business i do my tapasya to gain fame right so there is there has to be a material you understand where we are going with this all these questions kind of lead you to the same kind of understanding and in depth of where the rajasik or the satvik or tamasik mindsets are so it's all about what do i get in return and i don't want to do things till you know that's there's nothing in it for me what what is it so w i i f m what's in it for me attitude right and they want honor and respect and adoration of the people all the time so that's that's what drives the rajasiks tamasik is they don't care about the tapasya but they do things the wrong way and without any vidhi or without any um, uh you know any heed for it no respect for vedas or no respect for shastras but they do their own kind of tapasya like the asuras used to do to get very powerful and control others and to create a culture of negativity or culture of fear and their motivation is i can cause harm and damage to people who don't adhere to me so they want spiritual powers so all the vamacharas and the you know the uh the negative magics that we talk so that is their tapasya right so any of this and mo- i'm pretty sure most of you would have gone with this just a satvik and we are coming towards other questions and then i know that uh, you know this 20 minutes left <clears throat> charity when i say charity it is dhana and dharma this is a huge component of uh, chapter 17 and also chapter 18 dhana is basically in you to give right and a society would be uh, you know an ecosystem cannot survive a society cannot survive without the concept of charity if we stop helping each other even for the sake of helping sometimes it's financial gains but in many cases it has to be done because that's how we survive as a as a race as a human race so a satvik how like when somebody asks you for help what is your immediate attitude how do you give help 
So do you think that you help the person because it has to be given right away? I don't want everything in return. I don't even want to thank you, right? I'm helping because I'm in a position to help you. That's it, right? If that's the attitude, then you're a sattvic. But you also give it at the right time, the right place in the right manner, meaning you don't delay. So when a help is asked, somebody says, I want something by next month. And they're the right person. They have good character. So you have done a character study. Okay. And they're worthy. And a student is asking for something. So if they're asking for something, say, beginning of next month, and you go and help them three years from now, but that's not the right time or right place. So a sattvic helps it on the time, on the place to the right character. Desha, Kala, Patra. Very important. Right. Whereas a Rajasik is always suspicious of others. Now you come and ask for help, he'll think as if like everything is gone. Right. Why should I give? Now, uh, why can't you go and work? You know, those kind of things. So even if I give you, I need a contract. You come back. So, or, you know, they'll give a small thing. Like a, this is something that I've seen in South Indian temples. Something will be given to a temple, mostly a tube light. And they'll write their name on it. That light won't be visible. Only the name will be visible. So those, those kind of things. When you give to the temple, you want a recognition, your name on the board and those kind of things. That is a very Rajasic way of giving. Tapasic doesn't think that charity is required. They think charity is humbug. And all these people are asking money because they want to take away your money or this, they're robbers. You know, they're snatching your money away. And when they give, they give it in such a way that it's very cruel. They make you run from you know, post to post. They make you tired. They insult you before giving. And like Dhananda of the Chanakya. So those kind of things. So think, think of that as a very uh, you know, strong example of a tamasic character. And after all the running from pillar to post, sometimes they won't even give you. So that, that's a cruel intent that the tamasic mindset has. They have nothing but co uh, contempt for the people who ask for help. And I want to continue this. I didn't have the time when I was preparing the slides for uh, the rest because uh, I wanted to leave 15 minutes for question and answers on this because this is a great topic and this is, you're not done yet. There are more questions. And I want to continue which, you know, the chapter 17 and go into the chapter 18 part of the uh, Sattvic Rajasik Tamasic questions. And I just wanted to open up uh, the floor and ask for your feedback and do you think this is helpful and secondly i don't want your scores but do you understand how this works or, or how you can you know, elevate yourself yeah i can open up the uh... yes so yeah, one, yeah go ahead, please sorry are you able to hear me sorry. i was on yeah. my phone the uh uh, Sundarajanji, I was really skeptical before I took the pen to start jotting down. I was like, uh, I don't know if I learned the right things, but the, I think the approach of asking the questions, the way you have, uh, you know, uh, scaled this, uh, it's it's brilliant. I'm actually looking back to what I've written. It's nothing. I just created a table the way you showed it. Um, I think. Personally, when I look at my scorecard thing, if I have any of those categories where I am more on the Rajas or, you know, uh, my scores are higher, that is where I think I would like to, you know, devote more time to figure out what is in it me in me that I need to change to be able to uh, you know, make those scores go down and actually work on making the sattvic goals up. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is like, a, I, I created a very simple scorecard and I'm looking at it and I'm like, really? I never thought it like that. I right. never thought that even the dietary, I mean, we all know it, but uh, looking it, at it in such an organization, the way you portrayed it, it's very um, enlightening, I would say. Thank you, G. Yeah, wonderful. Wonderful. So is that the right approach? Is Am I going the right way when yes. I'm reading myself and self-assessing? Absolutely. And this and also the chapter 16, the Deva Asura Gunas. So okay. that becomes, and 
I, I started with this because this self-assessment is very important to jump into chapter three and four and five. And that's where the actual solutions for this come, like how to ele elevate yourself, the dhyana yoga. Uh, and, and what happens is Gita structure gives you, Arjuna was already good with this. So the Gita structure starts with, you know, the dhyana yoga and all, then talks about mm -hmm. this as an appendix. But for us as learners, we want to put this first, the self-assessment. And then when we go to chapter six and talk about, you know, how meditation, then we are already aware, self-aware. Am I a sattviki meditator, a tamasic meditator? And how do I move myself? Right, so, so, so that's the structure of the Gita that we are doing. But you're, you're on the right track. Thank you. This is really good, yeah. I think I need to keep this and uh, go back, like you said, once you do it, you will always want to refer back to it and say from three months from now or three years from now, how do you think you have grown as, you know, as a learner? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ji. Sundarji, uh, this is um, brilliant. Uh, obviously, um, you've been a coach your life, you've been teaching. So I think this is like a workshop. Uh, and I think uh, if I may share with you, like right now with the post COVID, mm -hmm. the whole thing is turned upside down. And as a medical doctor, I think there is a, fab, a phenomenal uh, recognition that the traditional way of thinking about health mm -hmm. is not working and is not real. Right. And last three months, uh, thanks to work like yours, I've been searching myself what this all about. And I think this tool you have just described is a tool for self-realization, self-assessment. Mm -hmm. And the question I have is, um, more I read Bhagavad Gita, the whole thing is three-dimensional. Mm -hmm. Everything is in threes. So for example, we're talking about uh, gunas. Mm -hmm. But the uh, science of health also has uh, body types or uh, uh, like uh, tapa, kapa, vita. So uh, uh, in terms of self-realization, mm -hmm. uh, these kind of uh, tables are very helpful. Then you are able to put yourself where you are and then and then work on it. So I, I think uh, one day or sometime, I think we should uh, really consider this uh, internal uh, re uh, realization or internal intervention. So the whole Gita really is internal intervention. What you do to yourself to understand who you are compared to external interventions with others do. Right. And for me, that is like integrative medicine, the best of East and best of West. Right. So, so thank you for now adding another piece of puzzle uh, now based on gunas. So I think as Monaji said, um, this is brilliant and thank you very much. Thank you, Ji. Thank you so much. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, this, when you actually combine it with medical, all of Ayurveda is a science of being healthy. And, and so, uh, pardon me for my bias, but the Western system is disease control rather than health. Like it's not a health system because if I'm a healthy person and go to a allopathic doctor there's nothing to treat right and in the Ayurvedic system it's more the healthy person is treated the disease is not treated you cultivate a lifestyle where you don't fall sick it's the other way around same thing with Gita it's preventive rather than curative yeah just my passion right now is how we can strengthen our current healthcare system right. and the gap which exists so uh, I will share with the group, uh, we are organizing a session on June 19th, uh, just to build this concept of integrative medicine. Mm -hmm. And a lot what you said today and what you've been saying, um, I have incorporated in my thinking, what I call integrative thinking. So I think uh, there is something here, which as Hindus, we, we have, a, in, I feel we have a bit of a opportunity to share with others. Uh, so uh, point by point, smaller, you know, it's something when you go to the temple or like this is an absolutely new way of thinking about who we are as Hindus. Absolutely. 
Uh, and so I'm I looking forward to that. Uh, please share that link of the uh, integrated yeah, medicine. Yeah, I will. Uh, as a matter of fact, I could talk to you offline and see how we could uh, capture your wisdom in that field, you know, because you have so much understanding. Uh, so if it's okay with you, if I could talk to you offline. No, no, you can talk to me, but I want to put a disclaimer. None of this wisdom is mine. It's all Gita's. Yeah, you have interpreted it. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Uh, willing to share it, you know. Sure. Absolutely. I'll be open to talk anytime. Ji. Thank you. Yeah, Dr. Garg is working a lot on this field already. And he has visited so many uh, medical schools to mm -hmm. uh, introduce this concept, uh, uh, Vedas and uh, meditation, all those okay. things. And he's very passionate. Absolutely. Like, uh, yeah, it's, it's fortunate to have, you know, that kind of, uh, you know, promoter for the integrated medicine uh, because things will change in the future. It, it cannot be just uh, treating the body or treating the disease. It, it, it has to be both. Yeah, sometimes people think it's crazy, <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. Correct. I mean, you, yeah, correct. You, uh, one question. Uh, you said you will find yourself uh, changed after a few months or so if you try. So, for, for example, of course, uh, I'm counting my number scores. <laughs> uh, I fall strongly in the first category, but still have some scores in the second one. Mm -hmm. And so, you when you say that you mean to see more, uh, further more scores in the first category, almost uh, uh, in Rasi category, uh, zero kind of thing or what? Not zero. So basically, there are times when because we are all professionals, right? So we have a transactional life outside. We work for salary. So there is some benefit we're working for. But the thing is, to have a spiritual success, so you want to have moksha or jnana, then the first category becomes you know, important, not just important, that's the foundation. So if you have more in the second, then meditation may not help you as much. right? So because you're already in the first category, just see which ones from the second can be transferred to the first category without affecting your, you know, uh, work style. And possibly I need you, the chart again with me, <laughs> your <Sure>. slide. <laughs> Absolutely. And and what happens is, I, I don't think anybody can leave all you know, just two and half zeros and sattva and rajas. Because there will be times when, you know, somebody is sick and somebody is lazy. You know, there will be times when there will be thamsic attitude. But as long as it doesn't affect your jnana, it doesn't affect your pursuit of knowledge. But if there's too much cruelty, then I would be worried. But if there's some passivity or you know procrastination based on other priorities, then it's okay. So th these are not hard and fast rules. These are guidelines, right? So. And I guess this is about, I mean, the journey that we are on about learning is will actually help us uh, create this more balanced scorecard, I would say. Correct. And uh, again, we are very fortunate that we are going through this journey and learning and, you know, uh, talking to like-minded people and talk, be able to do this more often to be able to understand the positive, you know, uh, impact that each one of us or each one of the good minds want to put out there. But at the end of the day, like you said, for personally, you always want to make sure that it is balanced. Yes. And even if, uh, I mean, I see myself, I see in the uh, diet or in the motivation area, if I have more of the recipe, there is a room for me for improvement, right? That's where I need to figure out what kind of goals I would be able to put as an individual as well as family, right? Because um, as a father or as a mother, I could actually influence and take these learnings and implement in my daily life for my children, for my whole family, right? And yeah, this is this is pretty good. Very, very nicely uh, portrayed. The way you explained them, uh, it, it made a lot of sense how to, you know, practically do it, implement it. That's very nice. And that's how I've seen Gita all along. It's a very practical manual. See. And, and and what I've always seen is people read the shlokas and just move on. Right. Not how it is supposed to be done. It's, it's, it's a manual that you take and you benefit out of, right? Most people just take 
Krishna and throws certain flowers and you know, bhakti is great, but bhakti is not enough until you improve yourself. Yeah. Right. So, so, but absolutely, Ji, like uh, this is a balance scorecard, like you said. Yes. And like I said, I totally feel um, very fortunate to be able to, for for the first time in my life, you like you said, we have always heard Gita or you know from our parents or grandparents, but not to a way to take every shloka or every chapter and be able to read that extract in a practical format, right? This is how uh, it all ties together. So this is very fruitful uh, for me and I'm pretty certain all of us who are on the group right now, this is very, very uh, motivated, motivational. Thank you. Jim. And that's the one thing he mentioned about tapas, tapasya of the five senses. That kind of keeps us on track and the filter has to be on all those five senses. Jim. And as Jim. he has mentioned before, to every moment, we are in the different, like sometimes rajas, sometimes tapas, sometimes sattva. And that's really with the tapas, with the tapasya, we have to move ourselves to more of the sattva side. Yeah. Yeah. Which makes the, yes. Yeah, right. Said the uh, over the time, we should talk about how, if you are in more of tapas side, how you can bring yourself to the rajas. Huh. And once if you are in rajas, then how you can bring to your tapas. So that's kind of like a journey also in that way, because now you found ourselves, okay, I'm mm -hmm. more in sattva side. Okay. Now what? Because that's why the Gita also, they say the Mukti Sastra. It's a Mukti Sastra too. So, <laughs> so that's a stage and the journey. Yes, that's really wonderful. It's really, we are privileged to be in part for him to explain to this extent. That matters a lot. Yes. Yeah. But Anjali, just to add to your, this thing, sometime you are uh, Rajasi, sometime uh, Satvik. Yes. So, yeah, the mind wavers mind waivers and it's a human tendency for this one you need a like-minded journey like people the one we are we need to remind our mind time and again time and again then you will be strong and strong so, yeah bodhik is very very important for everyone yes. and yes. swadhyay is also very important because the the book also and everything is scripture says one thought is enough to change yourself just mm -hmm. one thought of enlightenment and that's why they say the Gyan Marg is one of the toughest, but they say it's a high. So you have to jump in such a way that like you should cross over, otherwise you'll be deep inside. So, yeah, the Gyan Marg is really tough. Yes. One Thank, you. Thank, yeah. you. Thank you, Sundar Rajanji, for today's workshop. Uh, Sundar Rajanji, will you be sharing uh, this presentation in the group? Uh, this is recorded, no? Yeah, yeah but, but the slides like uh, where we differentiate uh, in Sattva, Tamas, and Rajat. I can do it. Yeah, let's see. Yeah. So, you want me to uh, post on the. Uh, yeah, I can do that. Yeah. That would be very nice. So. Sure, oh, sure. Wonderful, everyone. Pranoji, Uniji, anything? Dipenji, Purnima, Nadji, anything? If you guys. Thank Otherwise, you so we are much. close to the end of the yes. session. Namaste. Namaste. Lovely, actually. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Namaste. I have one question. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Uh, what if we are, uh, you know, that uh, uh, you said uh, food, uh, uh, Ram, Rajasik, Tamasik, uh, and Sadvik food. Uh, if we get uh, addicted certain food, how can we get out of it? Like. <laughs> Yeah. So that is through, uh, yeah. So all that, you know, how to get out will be in the initial chapters of the Gita, like mental training or the, uh, you know, Vairagya and all those things. But it comes with Abhyasa and Vairagya. Abhyasa is basically first you have to have the intent to get out. Nobody can force you. Right. Once you have that intent, because, for example, I'll, I'll give a very crude example. Now, I'll read a lot of books on diseases and this and that. Okay. The moment doctor tells me I have cancer, then I'll start, oh my goodness, I'm going to take a, or diabetes or something, right? Then you take your you know, thing seriously and then you have the motive to get out and have healthy foods. Most people don't have that uh, motivation to get out of their current state to the uh, other state. But there has to be a strong motivation. Sometimes it'll be seeing others. Sometimes it'll be a life-changing event or prarabdha itself or Guru Krupa. Any of this can force you into 
you know, a self-realization that, okay, my goodness, I am a tamasic or a rajasic. I have to get out of this. Once that comes in, you'll start finding ways or you'll have been a satsanga. Satsanga also helps that. With satsanga, you'll say, okay, my eating habits are bad, so I'll get out of it. And then you can cultivate the habits. But again, Thank it you. all comes from intent. Thank you. Thank you, Ji. Yeah. Yeah, quickly sharing my, my experience uh, related to whatever the question was raised. So if you have a clear long-term goal, it will help to make your choices easier. So say, for example, my goal is to be remain healthy till the end of my life. Clear goal. So when I look at the junk food, I can easily ignore it because I have a goal clear. So that will definitely help to, to choose your food as well. I want Absolutely. to share my experience, uh, how I traveled from the lower to the higher one. Since I joined HSS, I, I work in HSS. So this has helped me a lot, lot to bring a change in myself. That was a journey, like living, uh, experiencing and doing kind of a journey with uh, uh, all Baudic around us and all those things uh, living their way. So this can bring a change. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So that's the sun, the, the, the satsang part. I can see Murtinja <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Thank you so much, everyone. And looking forward again next week to have this live session and we can same question, oh, next level of questions, yes. Thank you so much, Sundaraji. Thank you, Thank everyone. You. Thank, you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.